everybody. Um, I am very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Megan Carell, who will be presenting for us today. She is um, a, a Louisville native. She did her medical school training here at the University of Louisville, and then she went to um, the Medical College of Georgia for residency in pediatrics. She came back uh, to Louisville two and a half years ago for her fellowship in pediatric endocrinology and has been doing a great job um, with us ever since. During fellowship, she's had three publications. One is, a uh, fourth is about to be submitted, um, and has also presented at the um, American Diabetes Association meeting. So she is um, thankfully going to join us on faculty. I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to say that <laughs> this summer after she finishes fellowship. So she'll be sticking around. But today she's going to share with us some of her research she's been conducting during fellowship. Thank you. All right, so um, as Dr. Watson uh, mentioned, I'm a, the third year pediatric endocrinology fellow um, and the research project I've been working on, um, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on diabetes control in youth with type two diabetes. And um, I'm really excited to have uh, the opportunity to share this with everyone. Um, we've been working really hard over the last several years and um, it's exciting to see um, the research uh, project come to a, a place where I can share it with people. Um, so I have nothing to disclose and no conflicts of interest. Our learning objectives today, so we'll do a brief review of current research on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on youth health outcomes, especially those with diabetes. We'll then discuss the methods of our study and then we'll review the re results of our study. And then we'll discuss the significance of our results and the future direction for further research. So the COVID-19 lockdown was stay-at-home orders were put in place in Kentucky on March 13th, 2020. This resulted in the closing of in-person education and the cancellation of many sports. These significant changes raise concern about the long-term effects children and adolescents will experience mentally, physically, and economically. So because of these concerns, we started looking at the literature to see um, what people had um, already looked into. Um, and there have been many studies using standardized questionnaires to look at dietary and physical activity changes um, in various populations before and after lockdown, but most of these have focused on the adult population. Uh, what most of these have found is that there was an increase in snacking and also an increase in vegetable consumption, but there was a decrease in physical activity. One group used an international online survey to explore the impact of restrictions on health behaviors and lifestyle at home. They found that the number of days per week of all physical activity decreased by 24%. And the number of minutes per day of all physical activity decreased by 33.5% during lockdown. The number of hours per day sitting increased by 28.6%. And there was an increase in unhealthy foods, an increase in the number of snacks per day, and an increase in eating out of control. The studies on pediatric populations have shown similar findings with a decrease in physical activity and an increase in sedentary behaviors. Um, the studies that focus on children and adolescents in general in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, mainly look at the psychological effects of the pandemic, and which is not surprising that this would be, um, you know, our biggest concern. And what these uh, studies have found is that there is an increased rate of anxiety, and depression amongst children and adolescents. One group performed a review and meta-analysis of 15 um, of these different studies on the pediatric population and found that 79% of children were affected negatively by the pandemic. Honestly, I, when I saw that statistic, I thought it would be higher, um, but some studies have found that children who are very introverted actually felt like their lives improved because of the lockdown, because they didn't have to have as much social interaction, um, which I thought was interesting. 
Um, children with pre-existing behavioral problems also had a higher probability of worsening of their behavior problems during the lockdown. So this particular um, survey assessed weight-related behaviors and social determinants of health before versus during the pandemic. It was given August through October of 2020 to caregivers of two to 17 year olds. And it was also given to adolescents who were 13 to 17 years old um, with a BMI of the 85th or higher percentile. And they had to be seen in clinic within six months before the pandemic started. They had a total of 129 caregivers and 34 adolescents that completed the surveys. And what they found was that there was a decrease in moderate to vigorous physical activity um, by 87.4 minutes per week. There was an increase in recreational screen time. Fewer youth had regular bedtimes. It went from 89% down to 44% during the pandemic. More youth ate most of their meals in front of the television. Um, there was a significant increase in food insecurity. There was reduced household income reported by 45% of caregivers. And caregivers also um, noted a higher stress scale score. Um, and what they saw was that those um, who had a higher uh, stress score and reported food insecurity were associated with greater magnitude of the other adverse behavior changes. So the CDC did a longitudinal trend in BMI before and during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, among persons two to 19 years of age. So they looked at data from 2018 through 2020. And um, what they found was that between the pre-pandemic and pandemic periods, the rate of BMI increase approximately doubled. So before the pandemic, BMI was increasing around 0.05 kilograms per meter squared per month. And during the pandemic, it was increasing by 0.1 kilograms per meter squared per month. They also found that the estimated proportion of persons aged two to 19 with obesity increased. So in August of 2019, 19.3% 19 of uh, children and adolescents two to 19 years of age were considered obese, and by August 2020, that had increased to 22.4%. So these graphs, I think, are um, very interesting to look at. So they, stratify, they stratified um, their data by age group, and then also within each age group by um, their um, uh, BMI index category um, before the pandemic started. And what they saw was that persons two to 19 years of age in all BMI categories, except for the underweight category, um, experienced significant increases in their rate of BMI change during the pandemic. Um, and which the underweight category would be the category we would actually want to be gaining weight. So very interesting. Um, and what they also saw was that those that were overweight and obese in the pre-pandemic period experienced significantly higher rates of BMI increase during the pandemic than those who were at a previously healthy weight. Compared with other age groups, children aged six to 11 years experienced the largest increase in their rate of BMI change with a pandemic rate of change that was 2.5 times as high as their pre-pandemic rate. And um, during March through November of 2020, persons with a moderate or severe obesity gained on average one and 1.2 pounds per month, respectively. So what research has been done on the COVID-19 lockdown and diabetes specifically? So most studies, again, focus on the adult population. Um, one group examined blood glucose levels of elderly patients with type 2 diabetes during the pandemic, and they found worsening glycemic control. Another group focused on adult patients with type 2 diabetes, and they found similar findings to that, uh, what was seen in the general population with an increase in snacking and an increase in vegetable consumption, along with a decrease in physical activity. And then 
Another group looked at patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, and they included a small subset of adolescents. They also found an increase in vegetable consumption, along with an increase in water consumption, uh, and also found an increase in screen time. So what research has been done in regards to type 2 diabetes in youth? So before the pandemic, the Search for Diabetes in Youth study um, was published, and it showed that the prevalence, the estimated prevalence of type 2 diabetes was increasing um, over time. So in 2001, 0.34 per 1,000 youths had type 2 diabetes, and by 2017, 0.67 per 1,000 youths had type 2 diabetes. Um, during the um, pandemic, this other group did a, uh, did a study um, where they looked at 58 different institutions and um, to see what changes and what incidence of youth onset type 2 diabetes we were seeing. Um, and what they saw was that the prevalence um, per center rose um, between 2016 to 2019, um, but they actually saw a decline um, between 2019 and 2020, um, they felt that this was likely due to a decrease in the number of encounters um, that they saw during the uh, pandemic, as opposed to an actual decrease in the um, prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Um, and they also uh, saw an increase in the median BMI percentile over time from 2016 to 2021. There has been a lot of research in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and um, severity of presentation for patients with um, new onset type 1 diabetes and some uh, research in severity of presentation of new onset type 2 diabetes as well. Um, this was one particular study um, along those lines um, that was done at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. It was a retrospective uh, medical record review, um, and they looked at um, new onset type 2 diabetics presenting between March and August of 2018, 2019, and 2020. And what they saw was that the proportion of subjects presenting with new onset type 2 diabetes and DKA dramatically increased in 2020. So in 2018, those that presented in DKA were 3% in, or sorry, 9%. In 2019, it dropped to 3%, and then in 2020, increased to 20%. Um, they also saw a steady rise in patients in general with new onset type 2 diabetes. So um, in 2018, there were 44 patients with new onset type 2 diabetes. This increased to 66 in 2019 and then 82 by 2020, so almost doubling in the course of two years. Other studies have shown a similar increase in uh, DKA numbers and severity during the pandemic, both in type 1 and in type 2 pediatric uh, diabetes patients. So another aspect that um, we were interested in looking at was um, BMI and um, escalation of treatment. Specifically, are there any predictors for treatment escalation? And um, there really isn't uh, a lot of literature on, you know, predictors of treatment escalation for youth with type 2 diabetes. Um, but I did find this one um, study that was a retrospective cohort study um, looking at um, medical claims database with data from 2000 to 2020. And the goal was to investigate patterns and predictors of treatment escalation within five years of metformin monotherapy initiation for youth with type 2 diabetes. They included 829 patients with a median age of 15 years at diagnosis. And what they found was that 25% of subjects underwent treatment escalation within five years of being diagnosed. And um, of these patients, 88 of them were um, escalated to insulin, which was 10.6% of the total uh, patient population in the study. 164 um, were escalated to non-insulin antihyperglycemics, 
And then 45 were escalated to both insulin and non-insulin antihyperglycemics. The time to treatment escalation was a median of 13 months. And they found that older patients were more likely to be prescribed non-insulin antihyperglycemics alone or before insulin. And the predictors of treatment escalation that they found that were significant in their study was an older age at diagnosis, Hispanic ethnicity, um, those with that reported Hispanic ethnicity were twice as likely to undergo treatment escalation as compared to those who identified as white. Uh, metformin was associated with an approximately fourfold greater likelihood of treatment escalation. And then the presence of other specified diabetes related complications at baseline also was a predictor for treatment escalation. So moving on to um, our particular study. So our study objectives were to evaluate changes in BMI and glycemic control in children and adolescents with prediabetes or type two diabetes during the COVID-19 pandemic, pre, during, and post lockdown. We hypothesized that this patient population experienced increased weight gain and worsening glycemic control during the pandemic. So we performed a retrospective chart review for patients seen in the pediatric endocrinology clinic for management of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes between September 1st, 2019 and June 30th, 2021. September 2019 was nine months prior to the lockdown. And then we um, wanted to have a whole school year where patients had the option to either be in person or virtual so that we could um, look at that factor as well. Um, so that's why we chose June 30th, 2021 as our end date. So our inclusion criteria, patients had to be 18 or younger at their initial visit. They had to have the diagnosis of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes based on ADA criteria. And they had to be seen in person, in clinic, at least one time before the initial stay at home orders in Kentucky, and then at least one time after. They were excluded if they did not have at least one visit pre-lockdown and one visit post-lockdown with a clinic weight measurement. So this just gives you an idea of all the different um, types of data we collected. Um, so the main things to point out, uh, at each visit we um, collected the A1C, BMI, the current medications they were on, if any dose changes were made during that visit. Um, we also collected data on the history of diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, and this was determined by either documentation and clinic notes, um, so patient reports, or by positive COVID-19 test in the chart. Um, we also um, recorded the visit type, so whether it was telemedicine versus in person. And then we recorded the current school program that they were in. So for our statistical analysis, we use generalized linear mixed modeling to compare the change in BMI and A1C over time between three defined time periods. And we also use this uh, to look at BMI and school type. And our three defined time periods, we had pre-lockdown, so September 1st, 2019 to March 12th, 2020. We had lockdown March 13th, 2020 through July 31st, 2020. And then post lockdown was August 1st, uh, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Uh, generalized estimating equations model was used to determine if BMI percentile change over study time predicted treatment escalation or de-escalation. And then poison regression model was used to analyze the number of visits between those with prediabetes who progressed to type 2 diabetes and those with prediabetes who did not progress. So we started out with 782 charts based on ICD-10 codes. And the ICD-10 codes we used were anywhere from very broad, so other abnormal glucose, hyperglycemia unspecified, um, all the way to more specific prediabetes, type 2 diabetes, et cetera. 
Um, so as you can imagine, we did get patients that did not have a diagnosis of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. Um, ultimately, we had 405 patients that were excluded because they were diagnosed after the start of the pandemic. 159 were excluded because they did not have the diagnosis of prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. 80 um, patients were diagnosed before the pandemic, but were not seen in the specified time frame. And then we had 13 that um, were too old um, for our study. Um, so we ultimately had 121 patients that met criteria and were included in our um, study. So here we have the demographic data for our study. The mean age was 14 and a half years. We had um, 33 patients with prediabetes and 88 patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, interestingly, we only had seven patients that reported or had a positive COVID-19 test in their chart. Um, race and ethnicity, we had 48% uh, were black, 34% white, and 12% Hispanic. And we also um, gathered information on insurance type, and 34% um, had private insurance and 70% had public. We did have six patients that had both private and public insurance, which is why that does not equal 100%. <laughs> Don't know why it's doing that. All right, so when controlling for COVID-19 time periods, BMI and A1C were found to increase by 0.127 and 0.071 respectively for each month from the first visit. There was, so we found that there was an increase in BMI over time. However, when um, the changes in BMI and A1C between the three defined time periods were not significant. So when comparing BMI change between pre-lockdown and lockdown and A1C between pre-lockdown and lockdown, there was not a significant change. And the same when looking at pre-lockdown versus post-lockdown. So this uh, table um, looks at BMI differences uh, amongst our three time periods, adjusting for potential confounders. And what we found was that BMI was estimated to increase for every one month increase from the first visit, um, like we saw previously. BMI was also estimated to increase um, for every uh, one year increase in age of the patients. And then BMI was estimated to decrease for every one month increase in uh, diagnosis duration. We did a similar analysis for hemoglobin A1C, and what we found was that for patients who identified as black race, the A1C was estimated to increase by 1.073 compared to patients who identified as white. For patients who identified as other race, the A1C was estimated to decrease compared to those who identified as white, and then hemoglobin A1C was estimated to increase for every one month increase in duration of di in, from diagnosis duration. So the next aspect we wanted to look at was did patients who continued virtual school in the fall of 2020 see um, a different change in BMI or A1C compared to those who went back to in-person school? Um, we did collect data, we did have some patients who were homeschooled and they were excluded from this analysis because their um, school uh, routine was not affected by the pandemic, um, so they were not included in this. Um, and what we found was that for BMI, there was no significant difference in BMI change between the three school type groups. BMI, once again, was estimated to increase for every one month increase from the first visit. For A1C, um, among patients who were in virtual school only, A1C was estimated to increase by 0.86 compared to those who were in in-person school only. Um, but there was not a significant difference in A1C among patients who were in a combination versus those who were in-person only. And A1C was estimated to increase for every one-month increase from the first visit. 
We also wanted to see if uh, a change of BMI could pr predict treatment escalation or de-escalation. And treatment changes that we included were adding or stopping metformin, long-acting insulin, hyperglycemia correction, mealtime insulin, liraglutide, or other medication. And what we found was that a change in BMI over time did not predict a change in A1C, treatment escalation, or treatment de-escalation. We also wanted to look at follow-up to see if there were any differences in BMI change or A1C change between those that followed up regularly and those that did not. Um, we initially wanted to look at three-month follow-up because that's what is uh, recommended in the um, standard. Um, however, we only had two patients that were seen at least every three months. So that was 1.7%. So not enough to really do a anal uh, statistical analysis on. So we said, okay, it's the pandemic for following up every four months. That seems reasonable. Um, so when we looked at uh, patients who followed up at least every four months, we had 23 patients who did that. Um, so only 19%. And uh, what we found was that there was no significant difference in BMI change or A1C change among those that followed up at least every four months and those that did not. We also wanted to see if anyone with prediabetes at the beginning of the study progressed to type 2 diabetes um, by the end of our study. And what we found was that of the 33 patients with prediabetes, 19 of them progressed to type 2 diabetes um, at their last visit in the study period. And that was 57.6% of our prediabetic patients. So when we, we wanted to look at if there were any um, differences between those with prediabetes who progressed and those that did not. And what we found was that um, those with prediabetes at the beginning of the study actually had, and who progressed, actually had a higher frequency of visits during the study um, compared to those who did not progress. Other covariates such as race, sex, age, insurance type, and duration of diagnosis were not statistically significant predictors for the outcome, so we did not control for them in this model. When comparing the two groups um, in regards to demographic data, there was no um, real significant differences between them. Um, there was no significant difference in BMI change between those that progressed to type 2 diabetes versus those that did not progress. Um, but we did see that, once again, BMI was estimated to increase for every one month increase from the first visit. So this study identified an increase in BMI and A1C over time. However, the changes in BMI and A1C between the three defined time periods were not significant in youth with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes in our practice. The change in BMI did not predict a change in A1C, escalation of treatment, or de-escalation of treatment. So prior to the pandemic, we, kn we know that obesity was already rising in youth it's been a problem for uh, several years. Uh, the um, update from the ADA American Heart Association that was published in 2022 um, showed that the prevalence of obesity in youth 2 to 19 years of age increased from 13.9% to 19.7% over the course of 20 years. And it's not just increasing in adolescence, which is what we think of most significantly, but it's increasing in all age groups, um, especially in the 6 to 11-year-old population. It seems to be increasing greatly in that population. So when, when we found that BMI and A1C were increasing with time, you know, could we just be seeing the increase in BMI that we were seeing already before the pandemic? In regards to school type, no significant difference of BMI change between the three school group type groups in the 2020-2021 school year was seen. Among subjects who continued virtual school in the fall, A1C did increase compared to those who were in-person school only. 
There is not much literature out there at all about virtual versus in-person school. Um, and that's likely because it wasn't really something we had to think about until the pandemic. Um, and one group has looked at this uh, very specifically. They looked at the impact of virtual versus in-person school on children meeting the 24-hour movement guidelines during the pandemic. And the 24-hour movement guidelines state that a child should have an accumulation of 60 or more minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. They should get 9 to 11 hours of sleep per night, and they should have two or less hours per day of recreational screen time. And so they looked at children who, um, who were half in-person and half virtual school. So they had two days a week in-person and three days a week virtually. And uh, each child wore a wrist place accelerometer for 14 days. Parents completed daily reports on how much time a child spent on a screen for school versus recreation. Um, they also recorded when they woke up, when they went to bed. Um, and what they found was that in-person school was associated with a greater proportion of days that children met the 24-hour movement guidelines compared to virtual school across all grades. And this was K through fifth grade. They found that uh, children were more likely to meet screen time and moderate to vigorous physical activity guidelines on in-person school days, um, but more likely to meet sleep guidelines on virtual school days. So at what they um, surmised from their research was that structured environments such as school have a protective effect on, child, on a child's movement behaviors, especially physical activity and screen time. In our study, only 19% of patients followed up either virtually or in person at least every four months. However, we did not see a significant, we did not see any significant differences in BMI change or A1C change among these two groups. Why didn't patients follow up? I think this is a question that, you know, we're always asking. Um, and I think the COVID-19 pandemic maybe added more layers to this. So economic factors have always played a part in patient follow-up. So if patients have transportation issues, um, they may not be able to come to appointments. In um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we know we offer telehealth. Um, so if patients had a lack of access to internet or technology, and or if they had technology uh, illiteracy, they may not have been able to use telehealth. Also, uh, for families that had uh, parents who had to work during the day, um, they still couldn't they still couldn't attend telehealth visits because we have to have a parent present with them to do that. Um, so those factors certainly played a role. There was also a fear of exposure to COVID-19 associated with use of public transportation or uh, perceived risk of exposure by coming to the office. The other factors for follow-up would be, you know, poor compliance. Um, or patients who have an improved BMI and thus have a perception that they don't need to follow up because things are getting better. So this particular um, research study um, was done in Canada, and their goal was to evaluate the direct impacts of COVID-19 um, on adolescents and young adults living with type 2 diabetes. Um, as well as the indirect impacts of the public health measures associated with the pandemic. So they um, looked at follow-up. They also looked at a lot of other different measures that I didn't include here. Um, and what they had a total of 85 uh, participants, ultimately out of 250 um, surveys that they sent out. And what they found during the pandemic was that 69.4% of participants were able to attend their healthcare appointments with providers through telephone or virtual visits, and then 30.6% were unable to attend their appointments. And the reasons listed were concerns about contracting COVID-19, their appointments were canceled or rescheduled and they couldn't attend them, um, or they were told to self-isolate by public health authorities. So their follow-up was much higher than what we saw in our patient population. 
but they did include um, young adults, so patients 18 and older who are responsible for their own health and their own transportation, things like that. So um, they may have had a better chance of, of you know, another aspect to think about in regards to follow-up. Our study identified disease progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes in more than half of youth with prediabetes. So 19 of our subjects progressed to type 2 diabetes. However, we did not see a significant difference in BMI change between the two groups. The prevalence of prediabetes has risen significantly among U.S. children and adolescents. Um, in 1999 to 2002, it was 11.6%. And before the pandemic, 2015 to 2018, it had increased to 28.2%. Prediabetes is associated with a more severe phenotype in children than adults. And one study stated that the progression to type 2 diabetes is around two to three years in youth who are not, um, you know, making any changes or things like that compared to five to 10 years in adults. This study was done um, before the pandemic, but I thought it was very interesting. Um, their goal was to determine the frequency of progression uh, from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes within the first four years of diagnosis in youth. Um, it was a retrospective study that looked at 106 youth with prediabetes, and um, they were followed over uh, the course of four years. They were recommended to receive medical nutrition therapy every three months following their diagnosis. Medical nutrition therapy was provided by a registered dietitian, and the schedule of visits was once every three months. The subjects were divided into two groups. The non-adherent group um, were patients who had one or less nutrition visits per year, and then the adherent group were those that had two or more nutrition visits per year. And um, what they found was that adherence to medical nutrition therapy may reverse prediabetes or at least prolong progression to type 2 diabetes. So 17% of all the subjects progressed to type 2 diabetes within four years of diagnosis. Of um, the non-adherent non subjects, 22.6% um, of them progress to type 2 diabetes compared to 9% of the adherent subjects. They also saw that the mean period of progression from prediabetes to type 2 diabetes was significantly shorter in those that were not adherent compared to those that were adherent. Interestingly, the adherent group had a higher BMI z-score compared to the non-adherent group, and this suggests that changes in fat mass and lean body mass may not be easily reflected by BMI changes, which is not surprising. It's something that we um, have talked about um, in the medical community before. I really um, like this figure, um, this Kaplan-Meier survival analysis, because I think it provides a really good visual of the effects of following um, recommended therapy. So, um, on our x-axis, we have the months from the time of diagnosis of prediabetes. The y-axis is the probability of remaining free of type 2 diabetes. We have um, the blue line is those that were not adherent, and the red line is those that were adherent. And you can see over time, both groups um, do have um, a, a higher or a lower probability of remaining free of type 2 diabetes, but that is significant. Um, the rate of progression is significantly faster in those that were not adherents. So the limitations of our study, we did have a small sample size. Follow-up bias was uh, def definitely something that could have affected our um, results. So it's possible that those that did not follow up had a more significant increase in BMI versus those that did or it's possible that they had an improvement in BMI. Uh, economic factors certainly uh, played a role in follow-up specifically, especially during lockdown. So we did collect data on insurance type, but we did not collect data on zip codes, which may have provided more information in this area. Uh, also, uh, we did not look at unscheduled encounters, such as like my chart messages or phone calls. 
So it's possible that despite missing visits, patients were still communicating with the, with the office to continue their care. Possible that medication changes were made, you know, during these telephone encounters um, and things like that. Medication compliance um, was another limitation, so we did um, collect data on this, but it's very difficult to um, analyze this. And then uh, it's possible that primary care physicians were practicing differently during the pandemic. So we know medicine completely changed during lockdown. It's possible that um, a lot of our patients turned to their pediatricians for guidance, and maybe they followed up with them in regards to their weight and uh, things along those lines, as opposed to following up with the specialist. So future research, so we wanna to continue to monitor rates of prediabetes and type two diabetes in youth post lockdown. We could look at patients with new onset prediabetes and type two diabetes before lockdown and after lockdown to see if there are any differences in BMI or A1C at time of diagnosis. So there have been, um, like I mentioned earlier in the talk, there have been studies looking at um, new onset type two diabetic patients um, in regards to severity um, in DKA episodes, um, but there haven't really been a lot of studies looking at prediabetes um, in the pandemic. And then looking at BMI in children and adolescents without a diagnosis of prediabetes or type two diabetes um, and comparing their BMI trends to those with prediabetes and type two diabetes. So the CDC's big um, study they did just did not um, look at any specific diagnoses in comparing those to those without diagnoses. So I think that would be um, helpful and interesting to look at as well. So I think the, the biggest takeaway from our research, you know, is that we did not see that the, the BMI necessarily was significantly affected by the lockdown in our patient population, but we know that it is obesity is still a problem and a BMI is continuing to increase whether or not the lockdown affected that rate of increase or not. Based on our, based on our study, it would, did not, but it is still a significant problem and it's something that we as a medical community need to continue to work to address. So this is my post-pandemic baby, and this uh, was her. This is her endocrinology onesie that she wore on um, our first um, call weekend back from maternity leave. So a uh, shout out to Dr. Folsom for the really cute onesie. Um, I want to thank Dr. Watson, my mentor on this project, and my many other projects um, for all her help and guidance with this. Um, I want to thank uh, Kahir, who was our um, statistician who was very patient with us and all our um, many questions and uh, my many questions. Um, I want to thank my scholarly oversight committee um, for their guidance over the last two years, their recommendations um, on how to approach this and different um, questions they asked me. I want to thank Dr. Kingery, who's my fellowship director for all her help and support. And then a special shout out to Dr. Montgomery. She's my co-fellow. Um, who uh, has listened to all aspects and stages of this project um, and has just been a great listener, and I really appreciate it. All right, so here are all my sources, and here's the event code for today. So do you see that? Worsen and then get better. So we didn't. We saw that in some patients individually that their BMI did get better, but it wasn't statistically significant. So, like, did somebody progress to diabetes or the other way? I don't think we had anyone. I don't remember. Oh, you mean that? Um, do we de-escalate the therapy if they had been resolving? I don't think so. I don't know that we, we didn't have a big group that ended, started at type 2 that did not end with type 2 as a final diagnosis, no. Yeah, we didn't have enough to, to look at that from a statistical standpoint. 
I have a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, one is, it, it seems very interesting to me to continue following these uh, uh, kids as you say you want to do. Uh, you know, because it, to see if perhaps if they get back into school, that they might get back to pre diabetic and stuff like that. But then another problem comes what about the fact that they're, they're going to get older and they may no longer be within the age range? So, you know, because with a small group, it's going to take a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so for example, like when you do one of your BMIs, you had a p value of 0.11. So that means 89% of the time, something happens. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, but again, with a small group, I mean, oh, these clinical studies, they do not have 100,000 people. <laughs> right. And I you think. Know, no wonder they have very low P values, even if there's only a tiny difference. <laughs> Anyhow, I, so I just wanted to, could you comment on some of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the. Um, things that has been hard in pediatrics in regards to type 2 diabetes is that RN, you know, is very small. And so it, it we have seen, you know, over time that that is increasing. But, um, yeah, before the pandemic versus post-pandemic, you know, that uh, number has definitely changed significantly. So, yeah, it may be hard to follow um, those patients over time as they get older, absolutely. Yeah. Were there any kids who got COVID in this group? There were, I think we had seven patients who um, had COVID-19. Um, Did anything happen to them? Mm -mm. No. no, they weren't hospitalized or anything like that. No, I mean, in a sense, in terms of vaccinine, was there? Oh, I understand. Not that we, we, um, I don't think we did, ran statistical analysis on that because the number was so small. Like we tried and it just wasn't feasible. Also, it might be a question of how sick they were with that small number. Right. Can you stop sharing? Yes, absolutely. Can you the question? Let's see. I can see. I don't see any questions currently. The chat. In the chat. Okay. So I'll ask a question out here. I didn't hear all the questions from the audience, but there's so many cases of sort of subclinical COVID infections, and one wonders to what extent viral infection of the pancreas could contribute to the accelerated prevalence. If you use the Canadian study as like a benchmark, to compare your prevalence is quite accelerated. And would it be useful when the people return to look for, for antibodies or some other markers to see whether in fact there was, and perhaps to look for island antibodies to see in fact whether the pancreas really has been affected uh, in the children who develop diabetes? Yeah, that would be interesting to look at. Have you read about that? Is that, are there people we, who fit into I that I don't cohort? think anyone has published anything about that. Dr. Watson, do you know? Well, you know, anecdotally, I, have, I haven't seen a publication. Anecdotally, we did have several kiddos who were diagnosed while hospitalized with severe presentations of acute COVID infections. I'm trying to remember if any of them had positive antibodies. I know, and thinking of the, I think there were three in, one of them I'm confident had negative antibodies. Um, and I don't know the answer to the other two off the top of my head. But it is a really interesting question. I mean, these studies have been in adults, so I don't know about the pediatrics in terms of the population. Did you say something with the uh, uh, that's a vehicle? Yes. Oh. So the, these were how that would have affected their uh, body weight, stuff like that. Uh, well, these were new onset uh, type two. In a way, kind of outlined. Right. These were not included in this study. They, they were they were just okay. uh, newly diagnosed during hospitalizations right. with severe COVID. 
And I was just thinking of these markers of the antibodies and, and things that uh, Dr. Winters was talking about. I do, I do think it would be interesting to look at our patient population that was excluded from my study because they were diagnosed after the pandemic. I mean, we had over 400 patients with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes diagnosed after the pandemic. So that would certainly be interesting to look at and to look at if they had COVID-19, you know, or, you know, something along those lines would certainly be interesting to look at. Good, good. Uh, so, buddy, uh, Thank you all. Aspects to that. Uh, 